Hello, my name is Lisa Ford Satter from Texas Children's Hospital, Baylor College of Medicine. It is my distinct pleasure and honor to be here. I wanna thank the Immune Deficiency Foundation and the Clinical Immunology Society for having me today to speak about the use of immunomodulators to control immune dysregulation in primary immune deficiency diseases and primary immune regulation disorders. Primary immune disorders can present with a heterogeneous phenotype. Primarily, we used to think of patients with immune deficiency as having an enormous infection susceptibility. However, we know that as our field has grown and as our ability to understand the underlying genetic defects that cause our immune deficiency and our immune disorders, that autoimmunity, autoinflammation, severe allergy, lymphoproliferation, and even malignancy can sometimes be as a prominent as infection. The human inborn errors of immunity have grown in number since the expansion of our genetic technology and access to genetic testing. So the, Union of, the International Union of Immunologic Societies Experts Committee every two years develops a report to publish in a very systematic and categorized fashion the inborn errors of immunity that have been reported thus far. And since 2005, it's been important for them to report it every two years. As, as you can see by this graph, the numbers have grown immensely. And even since the last report has come out, we've expanded our numbers beyond the 416 described in the 2019 version, which is the most recent version published in January of 2020. And in that publication, all of the numbers that you see in red um, on the graph are the new disorders that had been published since the 2017 report. All of the disorders are categorized in the following categorized categories that you see on this table that span the underpinnings of the mechanism that we see translated by the genetic defect. And so we are now armed with tools to identify the right pocket of the immune system in which our patient's defect occurs. And I wanna thank my colleague, Troy Turgeson for helping me develop this slide because it's an important concept. And the concept is that patients with immune disorders or inborn errors of immunity either present with a predominance of infections or a predominance of immune dysregulation. And those who present with infections as the most prominent feature can actually also have uh, immune dysregulation, but really the issue are the infections. And secondly, the patients with the immune regulation disorders present primarily with immune dysregulation, autoinflammation, or lymphoproliferation. And many times the infection susceptibility are driven by the massive amounts of immune suppression required to control the disease. So let's start with our classic immune modulator, immunoglobulin replacement therapy. It's been our mainstay for treating patients with immune disorders for many years. But we've evolved since then, and we've evolved into understanding whether or not we need to replace or modulate the immune system. So let's start with things that we know um, we can replace with. For example, in the ADA skid, we're able to replace the ADA enzyme with pegylated ADA. It's been available, it is available commercially, and many of us use pegylated ADA to bridge to transplant. We also care for patients who have been on pegylated ADA for many years to prolong transplant for a variety of reasons. The second is the treatment of hereditary angioedema. So this is the pathway that we're all familiar with. Um, and I'll point you here to one of the molecules that regulates our, um, our coagulation system, which is C1 esterase inhibitor. When C1 esterase inhibitor is missing or non-functional, it drives primary hereditary angioedema. And now we're able to replace this with recombinant C1 esterase. 
C1 esterase concentrates come in IV and, and now in subcutaneous form are available for prophylaxis as well as in emergency rooms across the country. And it was a breakthrough once we were able to provide this for our patients. We can also provide help downstream of the cause and provide areas where we can block the pathway which leads to angioedema, like bradykinin receptor antagonist, acatabant, or plasma calocrine inhibitor, alkalantai. These are effective where C1 esterase is not as effective or not available. We can also treat the downstream inflammatory effect. So when we know a defect causes a hyperimmune response, we can damp down that hyperimmune response by targeting with precision molecules. So for example, in leukocyte adhesion deficiency, where the, um, either the alpha or the beta subunit of the integrin is missing, we can understand that there is an immense amount of inflammation. These patients develop cellulitis. They have mucosal inflammation that's difficult to control. Well, the NIH and Steve Holland's group did some elegant work with their dental colleagues to realize that downstream inflammatory molecules such as IL-12 and IL-23 were activated and elevated in these patients. And by blocking it with ustekinumab or better known as Stellara, they were able to treat the patient's inflammation successfully. So for example, in the paper published in 2017, you'll see that this patient's gingival disease resolved and this patient's terrible sacral wound resolved with usikinumab treatment. We've come a long way since this initial meeting where Dr. Shearer and David taught us so much about the immune system and how treatments affect the immune system and patient outcomes. We've witnessed a memorable scientific re revolution in our field over the last 10 to 20 years, and technological innovation is providing some exciting possibilities for us to treat these severe diseases with small molecule inhibitors, antibody therapies, RNAs, and gene therapy. And it's offering us the ability to treat the non-infectious manifestations of primary immune disorders, which is typically some of our more difficult manifestations to treat. Severe refractory neuropathy, interstitial lung disease, autoimmunity, lymphoproliferation, severe allergy, endocrinopathy. But with some of the tools that we're gonna talk about and understanding the underlying genetic mechanism, precision therapy offers our patient a good quality of life. One of the things that we struggle with is the genotypic phenotypic overlap in some of our disorders, which is important to understand the underlying genetic defect because the phenotype may overlap, but the precision therapy may be different depending on the genotype. And this is the case in autoimmune cytopenias where the autoimmune thrombocytopenia appears clinically diagnosed clinically, but depending on what the underlying mechanism is and what compartment in the immune system the genetic defect arises actually dictates therapy. So understanding that can be key. So why does it matter? Well, it applies to spectrum of the natural history of patients. So understanding what the natural history of defects helps the next generation of patients. Mainly new discovered inborn errors of immunity share pathognomonic features with other inborn errors of immunity. And like I said, as the previous example for autoimmune cytopenias, we treat them differently. So understanding the underlying genetic diagnosis is important. Atypical presentation of known diseases is really key in understanding whether the presentation in your patient is typical or atypical. And even though it's atypical, don't stick to the definition because you might be able to investigate that your patient is just a milder form of the disease just because they didn't present at the age at which the textbook says it should have presented. We can advocate for precision therapy and immunomodulation knowing the genetic defect 
and implications for undiagnosed family members is so important for genetic counseling and pre-implantation genetics. So it affects prognosis and treatment. And I know that this is being talked about in another section, but I thought it was important to bring up because it has huge implications on immunomodulation. And here's a perfect example. So I took APDS, which is the syndrome caused by PI3 kinase mutation, to show that how patients with AEPS typically present and the distinct overlap of some of these important clinical features in other diseases of the immune system for which therapy would be vastly different. So let's talk about PI3 kinase signaling. It's a predominant signaling pathway for T-cell activation. It's important for T-cell differentiation and T-cell function. It's also important for B-cell differentiation and B-cell function. And so what we realized was when PI3 kinase defects were first described in 2014, what about treatment? How are we gonna immunomodulate these patients? They couldn't stay on steroids forever. Steroids left them susceptible to severe infections. These patients already have an EBV susceptibility, a CD8 defect, an NK cell defect. So in looking at the PI3 kinase pathway, it was important to understand that we already had a well-known, well-studied, effective modulator of, the, of something downstream of PI3 kinase. And so patients were started on rapamycin. And the first initial report suggests that there was significant benefit to the intense lymphoproliferation caused by this disorder, but it had less effect on other things like gastrointestinal disease, some of the cytopenias, some of the interstitial lung disease, but it really did have an effect on lymphadenopathy um, and hepatosplenomegaly. So then, rightfully so, a clinical trial was developed by the group at the NIH led by Kennedy Rao for lineolatib, which is a small molecule inhibitor against the P1 delta of PI3 kinase. And so when, when Dr. Rao looked at how his cohort was doing um, intermittently during the trial, he found that there was a reduction in the frequency of elevated transitional B cells. So if you noticed from my chart before, a very prominent feature of APDS. Normalization of naive B cell frequencies, which meant that the B cell differentiation defect was normalizing. CD2738 plasma blasts were also drastically reduced in a majority of patients, and PD1 CD4 positive cells were also reduced. Now, PD1 positive CD4 positive cells reflect, reflected either chronic or activated and exhausted T cells or increased circulating T follicular herpo cells, which we see in lymphoproliferation and autoimmune disease, and these were decreased as well as markers of T-cell senescence, normalization of IgM, and a discontinuation of IgG replacement, which, will, which really did solidify the normalization of the B-cell differentiation effect. Lymphoproliferation and cytopenias also improved. So lineolisib actually had a larger and more broad effect on resolving some of the clinical manifestations than rapamycin did. There are side effects in terms of weight gain and increased lipids, but the side effects are not nearly as weighted as the benefits thus far. The clinical trial is still ongoing and we await the final results. One of the other disorders that has a targeted molecule is the disorder of T cell, act, a disorder of T cell activation. So T cells are activated by engaging co-stimulatory molecules, and they are deactivated by engaging inhibitory molecules like CTLA-4. So T cells are activated when CTLA-4 is not engaged by the antigen-presenting cell, and then when CTLA-4 sees its ligand CD80, CD86, um, it shuts off T cell activation. This is important because CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency causes a dysfunctional or deficient CTLA-4 molecule. 
In addition, LRB, LRBA deficiency also causes a similar clinical phenotype because LRVA is essential in trafficking CTLA-4 to the surface. So when that mechanism is broken, it is as if CTLA-4 doesn't work. So CTLA-4 Ig fusion protein actually partially rescues the phenotype of CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency and LRBA deficiency. And that is abatacept and bilatacept act as a surrogate for the missing or dysfunctional CTLA-4 molecule. Hot off the press this month, that's why it says journal pre-proof online, is an international cohort um, by Voter Grimbacher's group in Freiburg where he looked at just treatment of CTLA-4 um, CTLA haploinsufficiency. And what he found was a batacept was used when there was severe end organ damage. So like granulomatous lymphocytic infiltrative lung disease or neurologic involvement or gastrointestinal involvement. It appears that a batacept is very well tolerated and helps with the resolution of, of the disorder of the lung and the GI tract, but it wasn't employed for lymphoproliferation, cytopenias, and the skin involvement. So it's not clear as to whether or not it works for those organs, or it just wasn't employed because other therapies were working just as well. I wanted to tell you about a case where broad immune suppression and immune dysregulation were so severe and this poor child had to undergo a lot of intense immunomodulation before we were able to sort through what the underlying mechanism was. So she had been treated for her severe interstitial lung disease, her TPN-dependent neuropathy, and her refractory autoimmune cytopenias with methotrexate, 6-MP, solumedrol, CAMPA, cytoxin, and then repeated Campath, Cytoxin, 6-MP, and Solumedrol. And as a result, she had multiple disseminated infections and liver toxicity. So we did whole exome sequencing and we found a mutation in the STAT3 gene. And we didn't believe it at first because here you'll see that the paradigm for STAT3 was that mutations in STAT3 caused the loss of function, and it was the autosomal dominant form of hyper IgE syndrome with low TH17, and these patients had a susceptibility to mucocutaneous candidiasis, pneumonia, dermatitis, and connective tissue abnormalities. But our patient really had lymphoproliferation and interstitial disease and didn't really fit the phenotype. And through a series of collaborations, we found that there are mutations in STAT3 that confer gain of function signaling. And that is exactly what our patient had. So we've collected an international experience of 170 patients with STAT3 gain of function disease. And it turns out that the majority of these patients had very similar manifestations to our index case, lymphoproliferation, autoimmune cytopenias, growth delay, severe neuropathy, and pulmonary disease. Another STAT disorder where the phenotype has evolved over time is STAT1 gain of function disorder and how it was originally described as a disorder of chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis. But in, upon further investigation and time learning how these patients present, we see that it is a heterogeneous disorder caused by autoimmunity and significant infection susceptibility. But we have small molecule inhibitors that inhibit the JAK-STAT pathway. There are four JAK-STAT inhibitors that are FDA approved at this time. And they inhibit specific molecules causing gain of function disease. So we collected a few years ago, the international experience of treating STAT1 gain of function and STAT3 gain of function with JAK inhibitors. For STAT1 gain of function, we, we collected 11 patients, six of which had neuropathy, six of which had autoimmune cytopenias, and six had, and all of which were controlled with the GAP, JAK inhibitor, 
CM, the chronic mucus cutaneous was actually also better controlled on DAC inhibition. And 10 of the 11 patients survived with resolution of some of their disease manifestations. The one patient that died was started on a JAK inhibitor after they were infected with disseminated coccidiomycosis. So it's not clear as to whether or not the JAK inhibitor did not have an effect because she already had disseminated disease or if the JAK inhibitor made the disease worse. For STAT3 gain of function, six patients have treated and four survived. Two had resolution of their enteropathy, three had resolution of cytopenias, three had resolution of autoimmune hepatitis, and one had resolution of autoimmune-driven hepatic venous stenosis from the inflammatory vasculitis in the liver. One had marked improvement of her respiratory status, and one had resolution of HLH. One of the patients died on therapy. However, the other patient that died had very good control of his disease. He died of post-transplant complications. Our patient that I highlighted is actually off oxygen, off TPN, and has barely been admitted to the hospital in the last six years. So we were really excited to be able to use the soft label for the STAT gain of function disorders, but JAK inhibitors are also being more broadly used in other inborn errors of immunity that cause immune dysregulation, such as the interferonopathies like SAVI, CANDLE, POMP, and acardi butyri have very nice control of the immune dysregulation with JAK inhibition, baricitinib, and rexolitinib, as well as toposidinib. In addition, there are clinical trials for hemophagocytic lymphocytosis or HLH and macrophage activation syndrome. Cytokine storm and macrophage activation, such as seen with CAR T cell therapy, is also being treated with small molecule inhibitors and monoclonal antibodies. Targeted are IL-1 inhibition, IL-6 inhibition, TNF-alpha inhibition, and IL-18 binding protein, which are in clinical trials in the US. Refractory cases can also be treated with ATG and tacrolimus. But with the advent of IL-1 inhibition, IL-6 inhibition, and TNF-alpha inhibition, as well as IL-18 binding protein in the works, they are a much better and safer option than ATG or tacrolimus. And moving through, speaking of um, IL-1 and IL-18, the inflammasonopathies now have an array of options in the IL-1 inhibition realm, as well as IL-6, and then IL-18 binding protein. So many of the disorders that I have discussed and the immunomodulators that I have discussed, you can find in this article that Dr. Lighting and I presented a few years ago. But really the reason for me putting up this table is to show you how broad our immunomodulation choices are expanding and how understanding the underlying mechanism of the disease can really precisely target therapy and improve the patient's quality of life. So my final thoughts are, a significant number of immune disorders present with immune-mediated pathology as major features of infection. Specific genetic disorders are teaching us about the basic mechanisms so we can actually better target therapy. If you know the cellular mechanism or the genetics, you can personalize your patient's therapy. It's incredibly important in this era, and it is a team sport. We need all of our colleagues and all of our staff members and the patients to create a thoughtful team to bring the precision therapy to fruition. Innervation, using mechanism to employ new therapies for safe and innovative immune modulation and cure is key for our specialty to advance in the future. I'm so thankful to be here. I want to highlight that um, I give this talk in memory of Dr. Shearer, who is a staunch advocate of the Immune Deficiency Foundation and a steadfast supporter and participant in the Clinical Immunology Society. I want to, I want to thank the patient and families. Without them, we don't have this kind of purpose to make their lives better. And we appreciate their partnership 
all my funding mechanisms and all of my colleagues out there doing this work. Thank you so much.